On the night of the murder, I was 26. A clean-shaven special ed teacher living in a ski town in Wyoming, across from a public school for handicapped kids, which was convenient because I worked there and I didn't have a car. For outings, I'd sat out a school-supplied pinno whose doors sagged so low you had to lift them to close them, which I usually did for the kids, and then drive one flew over the cuckoo's nest style into town. My favorite kid was Tom. He was 21, wore a baseball hat sideways, and while he couldn't tell you what he had for breakfast, he once remembered how I'd given him a Diet Dr. Pepper and a year later gifted me a gold spittoon. I'm only able to tell you this because I wasn't shot that night, because I didn't have a mustache and I sleep on my back. In fact, I'd almost died a couple of times by then. Once, I'd take my eyes off the highway to struggle with a glove box tape machine that was eating my Pablo Cruz cassette when a voice within said, look up. How I squeezed past the 18-wheeler parked in the breakdown lane, I still do not know. Another time, I'd hit on a friend while hiking just to scare him because we'd heard about recent bear maulings. My friend took off running, which I thought was hilarious, except he made it to camp to sip hot, sip hot cocoa, and I got lost and had to hide from a hailstorm in the bushes where a bear approached and full body sniffed me. My heart was humming like a Mazda, and I thought, how long can I play dead? The answer is three hours. The whole time I was thinking, I went to college for this, and then the bear just walked away. The lesson there is, don't get drunk and hide on the guy with the map. <laughs> Anyhow, the murder had been execution style, a single bullet from a rifle. A young guy from Idaho had been shot in his sleep two doors down. His photo in the paper looked eerily like me, except he had a mustache. Earlier that night, I'd gone to a country bar to watch the locals two-step, an odd dance that looks like jitterbuggers randomly getting tased. The bar there had saddles for bar stools, and it's hard to keep a straight face while kicking your leg over an actual horse saddle bar stool in a bar, but I did it, and drinking beer, cheap beer, I wondered if I'd ever be known for something. My bed at the time was a windowsill. I didn't have enough for a bedroom, but the living room had a wide sill with a thick cushion and a fireplace. I also had my pet parakeet, Foghorn, who I'd move his cage closer to the fire as it died down, but not so close that he might get cooked. Climbing onto my sill that night, the quiet re voice returned. Lock the door, it said, but being buzzed and lazy, I ignored it. I then had the most vivid dream, where a man stood directly above me pointing a shotgun in my face. But was it all a dream because I woke up to a knock at the door and a state trooper asking, where were you last night at 2 a.m.? The cops followed me for months because I'd gone from almost mistakenly killed to murder suspect. And they followed me until one freezing morning when I got into a pinto with Tom. Relieved to no longer see an unmarked car in the rear view, I thought about how many of us are still alive through blind luck or some kind of grace. Distracted, I'd forgotten to close the door for Tom, but determined to talk him through it, I said, just lift and pull, Tom, just lift and pull. The drooping door clanged against the phrase and dump the frame a dozen times. Then suddenly, ka-chunk, he'd done it. He turned with a look of shock and elation and a vast, proud smile. Mystified all the way into town, Tom shook his head, repeating over and over what I'd wondered so often. Jesus Christ, Ed, how did I do that? <laughs>